I'm happy to introduce our lecturer this evening, Paolo, Paolo Cascone. Uh, Paolo was born in Naples and grew up between Italy, East Africa, and the West Indies. Educated at the AA, Paolo has been researching and working to develop an inter interdisciplinary design methodology in the field of echo logic design, his words. He founded Co-Design Lab in 2007 in Paris, where he's also taught at the Cole Spatiale d'Architecture. Co-Design Lab is an architectural practice and design research laboratory, positioning themselves at the forefront of performance-oriented architecture and environmental parametric design. Their approach is based on a morphogenic, morphogenetic process in which the cause-effect relationship between form and performance structures each project in a site-specific way. In this way, they question how to reconcile techne and artifice with nature with an aim towards defining new relations between high-tech design and low-tech construction, as we talked about, which will be interesting to see. It goes without saying that many architects today are experimenting with and developing computational strategies to affect architectural form, some of whom are interested in the purely formal, and others who believe that these strategies are leading towards a fundamental paradigm shift in how space is experienced. There's another group, however, who believe that these strategies can be manipulated towards the ecological environmental crisis of our times in new and dynamic ways. Paolo's work is clearly situated in the latter camp. Sire, please join me in a warm welcome for Paolo Cascone. Thanks, John. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Uh, thanks for Sayak for inviting me. Uh, apologize for my Italian, French, English. <laughs> I'll try my best. Um, my talk will be uh, divided in two parts. Uh, I will try more, more than a lecture, it will be a sort of a proposal. Uh, I'll try to stimulate you to pick some of the issue um, I'll try to actually I'm, a, I'm, I'm an architect I'm a designer but I'm also involved in uh, environmental engineering and as a very uh, as we were talking before with John as a very delicate uh, terrain bug in between uh, in between you know using uh, environmental variables uh, as drivers for uh, uh, to integrate in the design process and also to be very rigorous in a way you can uh, use uh, uh, very specific uh, engineering tools in order to test uh, uh, the results of the design process. So it's, it's very difficult and I would say I would be very uh, Honest, intellectually speaking, <laughs> it's a, it's also a very subjective uh, way of using that. I mean, as a, uh, I'm saying that because the, I'm trying also when my t teaching activity to be honest with my students and saying that uh, you know designers are always the ones who make decisions out of uh, you know this kind of information-based uh, design process, and I'm also. Um, I'm conscious about uh, this idea of uh, not just uh, um, doing digital architecture uh, for digital architecture, but trying to work a little bit on a sort of theoretical background and uh, define a, uh, a way of uh, 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 being critical using um, environmental uh, issues uh, to be creative somehow and generative. I'm saying that because uh, uh, when I start to work on this kind of uh, uh, research agenda, um, I start to understand, I was coming from a very traditional Italian background because I graduated from the School of Architecture of Naples, which is very, very um, uh, rigorous in terms of, you know, all these kind of historical and preservation issues. Uh, uh, a little bit um, less and then more uh, design-based process. Uh, but anyway, I was, uh, <coughs> uh, there's uh, always coming this kind of 
uh, 70s rhetoric on uh, how we could somehow uh, develop some, uh, let's say, sustainable architecture, different skills. Um, and I was very critical at the beginning of my PhD because it's a, I'm trying to find out from the scientific literature uh, what could be a sort of in integrated way of uh, working on uh, both uh, form finding and at the same time a sort of site-specific way of uh, developing um, uh, a performative uh, design in terms of uh, you know thermal comforts and, and uh, uh, other kind of issues related to uh, um, sustainable uh, architecture. And you know, the, in the 70s and in the 80s, there was a lot of literature uh, talking about sustainable design as a sort of technolo technological issues where uh, the, the final, the formal result was just, you know, applying technology uh, or it was a sort of greenwashing. So I was trying to ask myself how eventually could surpass this kind of uh, approach to sustainable design. And of course, I mean, the, the, the most interesting thing was, you know, uh, trying to uh, work on a design process, which is, uh, which is more like uh, um, dealing with the um, complex system of uh, uh, different variables, uh, not just environmental, but also uh, uh, social and cultural uh, uh, aspect. And also, uh, I start to um, have a look around about, you know, the more interdisciplinary way of uh, approaching site-specific architecture, being inspired by uh, biomimetic engineering. And, and so I start to have a sort of a, a more uh, interdisciplinary uh, uh, a background not just related to uh, architectural issues or environmental, uh, very deterministic uh, uh, approach to sustainable design, but also be inspired from uh, other um, disciplines, more philosophic or more uh, uh, related to biological uh, um, uh, aspects, and try to find relations in between an evolutionary way of, uh, of um, of an analyzing uh, animated and non-animated um, systems and an evolutionary way of developing uh, architecture which could eventually be uh, sustainable and, and site-specific. Uh, so let's try to work really on a, on a, on a more um, multi-parametric uh, uh, approach and uh, try to define uh, a way of uh, uh, interact uh, very uh, specific and generalistic tools and uh, also uh, more uh, design-based uh, tools. Always inspired this idea of uh, uh, mm, working not just as a uh, techno technological issues but more trying to uh, uh, work with other concepts more uh, based on, on some keywords like uh, differentiation, like uh, redundancy, and like material optimization. Um, um, and there are very interesting ex examples on nature uh, uh, according to this concept of adaptability and, and, and self-organization. Uh, probably could be used also for uh, architecture and a more, um, uh, in architecture as a sort of frozen dynamic system. Um, uh, so it's a, the idea is really to uh, uh, create uh, a way of, um, uh, First of all, uh, correlate data uh, and and understand the relation between different variables, uh, and which some sometimes are uh, interrelated in order to, to create uh, specific conditions. And that's why very I was very much interested in uh, uh, try to um, uh, 
uh, not just uh, the work with, with, with some um, environmental uh, tools, but also try to be critical on the results and, and uh, start to work with, the, with the, the information also in a more dynamic way. Um, what, I'm, what I will show you today is, is not just a list of projects, it's more like uh, the design process as I start to work with. And I found this more interesting for a school of architecture rather than shows every single project. So, for instance, I will show you different uh, scale project and this different way of using uh, um, animations and and uh, flight dynamic uh, um, uh, analysis. Um, always with this idea of uh, uh, use information in a more gener generative uh, way. Um, uh, the idea is, is, is really to um, start to create sort of initial ground where you can uh, uh, localize in time and space how uh, dynamic uh, issues could eventually a different scale affects uh, a specific site in order to uh, start to uh, define a strategy that uh, that uh, take uh, that somehow negotiate in between different uh, different uh, variables and you know this is a very uh, delicate. Uh, a uh, way of working with this on, on this uh, on this topic because um, sometimes environmental engineers are not very much interested in uh, the potential uh, the generative potential of using uh, environmental diagrams uh, and architects also uh, probably use that in a more formalistic way without really being specific in terms of uh, what kind of uh, of performances and what kind of Relation between material systems and performance could be so it's it's very it's very uh, difficult uh, somehow. And so uh, I've shown you some um, different diagrams. This, for instance, was a, was a diagram related to um, uh, a peripheric soundscape project, where the the priority was to um, work with the sound pressure and along this uh, you, mm, big infrastructure in Paris, which is a sort of ring, there's uh, a barrier in between uh, intramurals and extramurals, where the, the infrastructure uh, is really affecting in a, in a, in a, um, in a strong way uh, the, the also other uh, social and economical issues. So I start, we start to work on the, with some very interesting softwares uh, that were um, um, you know localizing uh, the, where the the flux of vehicles and vectors were m m affecting uh, uh, in a very critical way uh, the surrounding of the infrastructure uh, um, and eventually define a strategy where uh, the architecture the skin of architecture the envelopes could will respond to uh, to the sound pressure. Um, Again, I mean, it's a <clears throat> the way there's no there's not really a tool who's a, a digital tool who's uh, uh, doing this directly. I mean, I think it's always the designer and the and the, and the environmental uh, engineer that is uh, is evaluate diagrams and evaluate the the data and 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 define an initial strategy. Um, one of my first concern in my teaching activities uh, is related to uh, also um, some of our uh, explain to my students that um, parametric design is not really belonging to digital architecture. It's something that is, uh, uh, especially if we are talking about uh, environmental issues, it's, it's something that is uh, is uh, already developed in, uh, uh, by other architects and engineers uh, without any use of, of digital tools. Uh, I think the, using digital tools is uh, it's, it's really an advantage in, in terms of 
uh, being able to uh, anticipate uh, and, cr and somehow uh, define trends uh, for the future. But I was quite, um, quite fascinated when I start to use, uh, start to work on 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 a, on, a, on a sort of environmental form finding uh, approach to the work of Freyota because I th probably was one of the first uh, designer <coughs> and engineer who was really working on this idea of making differentiated structure out of a sort of uh, of a, a bottom up process where. It was using it was using component a very simple component according to the initial variables giving priority to one variable and then proliferate the component and differentiate according to a specific program or or a specific dynamic um, uh, so th of course using digital tools is a is, it's a, it's an advantage because you can really have a sort of a uh, interrelated way of uh, uh, of working with the uh, uh, cause effect relationship between uh, self organized organized systems and and, and uh, environmental variables environmental dynamics um, al always with this idea of uh, um, create a sort of interdependency in between uh, each of the component that are somehow uh, proliferated on a skin on the surface or at different scales on a urban urban uh, texture or urban fabric um, so those are um, some examples of a very interesting um, unfriendly uh, <laughs> uh, tool which is called generative component and the uh, generative component uh, was probably one of the first uh, tools that uh, uh, could allow to uh, import like some path or other uh, environmental issues and start to create sort of a direct uh, uh, relation between uh, geometrical and dimensional issues. And, and so it was, uh, this was one of my first interest in uh, I'm saying that because I'm not really a digital designer so I, uh, I, I'm honestly I probably I'd, I was quite critical when I started my studies on that and they I'm, I'm not even sure that digital design exists uh, but of course it's, a, it's very interesting to uh, uh, create a dialogue between uh, 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 dynamic aspects and the structural uh, uh, formation and, and, and growth. Those are some experiments I did with my design unit students uh, using some Rhino script, um, always related to this uh, sound pressure uh, workshop where we try to basically uh, define um, uh, some interesting relation between the the, 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 the the structure density and and the volumetric organization of that and and the the, the, the gradient of sound pressure according to uh, according to the, the the proximity to the to the infrastructure but the idea here was you know defining structure would be able to uh, break uh, the sound waves um, uh, so, uh, one of the concerns is, you know, using an environmental variable for uh, defining the initial architectural action and then uh, work on uh, how this could uh, create potential for programmatic issues. Um, for my ecological uh, understanding of uh, 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 sustainable design uh, using digital tools is also an, ad an advantage uh, and uh, it's very powerful because it's somehow reproducing a biological process of uh, uh, an evolutionary process of uh, making catalogs of configuration out of uh, an initial genotype. Uh, 
Um, I think this is quite powerful because you really start to, um, um, uh, you could start to project from an initial um, uh, system of routes and constraints, and then you can, uh, by setting uh, um, um, specific um, growth uh, condition, you can generate phenotypes of configuration, then you can start to um, uh, eventually uh, test it. Uh, and make decision. Um, uh, make decisions means uh, not just looking for uh, the best uh, configuration which is uh, uh, performing in terms of thermal comfort or, or passive cooling ventilation. Uh, the best configuration uh, is, it's, uh, it's, uh, I think it's, it's, a, it's the best negotiation between uh, different scenarios. Uh, okay. Um, uh, so this is one of the advantage of being a, a sort of an environment, having a, 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 an environmental engineer background. Uh, so the idea is uh, to um, evolve your shape, giving materiality to that, and also um, starting to understand in a more specific way how uh, your system could behave. Uh, this was a very basic um, experiment on a, on a facade system where actually uh, the idea is uh, you know, to just understand how a single system just by rotating itself could be um, and putting some um, uh, photovoltaics, uh, photovoltaic panels could uh, produce more or less uh, according to a specific uh, microclimatic condition. So again, sometimes you, you work with very uh, complex shapes, sometimes you, you work with mm, uh, more or less complex shape, but the idea is always to have a sort of control. And um, have a control uh, doesn't mean that you control all the variables. Uh, here again, I have to be very honest with you. I mean, it's a, um, sometimes um, students are very demanding on that. They really want to know uh, which shape is the best shape according to uh, a specific uh, performative criteria. Uh, um, I think, again, the, the cultural background is very important because it helps you to give priority uh, to one uh, aspect of your project and probably make decision about that. Um, mm, so, uh, the designer is, uh, has this sort of responsibility of integrate this control in this design process without necessarily uh, 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 the need of uh, uh, environmental engineers, especially in the, the, the very first step of, uh, of the concept design. Um, uh, this is quite helpful because it's a, uh, it makes you, it, it's, it's hoping you, it's hoping you a range of opportunities of, of uh, evolve your 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 material system and your and your and your and your shape and again sometimes you, you just making a matrix of of how you can uh, evolve your shape and how different parameters according to daylight and solar radiation and energy production could you know, um, give you the right answer for when you're looking for the best, the best, or the the better configuration for your your specific program. Um, one of the output of this design process is also you know, once you make your your decision out of this kind of uh, uh, back and forward process of um, producing. 
uh, catalogs of shapes and then test it and make the decision and understand uh, um, the, the performances uh, is uh, to freeze. I'm saying that because uh, Goethe was saying something very interesting about that, about, uh, about frozen uh, uh, systems. Um, saying that because sometimes, uh, especially when I used to study the uh, um, performative design was identified uh, as a, a sort of a robotic um, uh, or uh, very cinematic system where you were, you know, walking on the floor and there was something happened everywhere. And I was quite skeptical about that. One of the main examples I do with my students is about the um, um, Fondation Cartier building in, in Paris. I don't know if you know that. It's a, one of the first general well building. Uh, it was a very exciting project because it started to work on this concept of uh, 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 adaptab adaptab adaptability of the, of the skin of the building according to day lighting. And I don't know if you see, if you uh, remember this project where the, the facade was uh, uh, made by uh, um, a sort of uh, um, panelization system be made by di um, diaphragms uh, system that were somehow reproducing the same Musharabia technique coming from the, uh, um, the um, the Islamic Center, I'm talking about the Islamic Center. So they, they, they were reproducing the Islamic uh, patterns uh, in, uh, in a way that the, there was a cinematic system uh, that was opening and, uh, and, uh, and closing according to the light. This system was working just the first couple of months because the, the, the cinematic system was so expensive and difficult to maintain. And, but, some, but this, Probably was very interesting because the, the, the facade was very differentiated, very f frozen, not dynamic, but differentiated. And I think this probably is the, one of the main output of, uh, of this kind of uh, approach of, of uh, let's say, uh, environmental performative design. It's, it's really um, uh, try to develop very differentiated and site-specific uh, configuration uh, with this idea of, of having a frozen, uh, a frozen configuration, uh, which is a, a sort of gradient uh, of, of different configuration that are somehow generating different conditions in the in the in door of the building, um, as I was saying before, the, uh, I'm, uh, one of the most challenging aspects of uh, what I'm trying to do is also um, try to test th this design process at different scale. Um, I'm actually uh, directing a research project with another. Uh, colleague uh, Andrea Di Stefano, which is uh, 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 um, which is called the U Urban Ecologies, and is a more uh, a territorial scale project, uh, also with the aim of uh, of uh, developing strategies for sustainable infrastructures. Uh, this project was a winning proposal uh, from um, uh, financed from the French Ministry of Culture and research and, uh, and environment. And actually, it was, um, it was a, we have a very, it's a research by design project. Uh, we have a very specific site along uh, the Escu Canal, which is a uh, northern part of uh, France, close to the Belgian um, border. And it's a very interesting uh, post-industrial site. And actually, the one of our sponsor, which is a uh, EDF was interested, Electricity de, de France is interested to develop a sort of prototype of an eco-friendly neighborhood. Uh, so we were quite skeptical at the beginning of the notion of eco-friendly neighborhood. Uh, we tried to work a sort of system of uh, morphogenesis 
uh, where the, there was a sort of kind of sound, um, sort of um, cause effect relationship between uh, the, the ground morphology and fluid risks. Uh, because this is a very close area to the canal and uh, with a lot of problems related to flood, uh, fluid dynamic uh, issues. Uh, this project is far as, uh, has, has been de uh, developed by um, different researchers. This is uh, um, one of the output made by Andrea Di Stefano, which is working with me. And um, the idea is, uh, is always to uh, using uh, um, uh, environmental variables, environmental mapping to, mapping to uh, define an initial organization of the morphology of the ground and, and, and that could eventually uh, help uh, the way of developing biotic corridors and uh, sort of system of uh, uh, feet of depuration of the water and that could uh, generate conditions for uh, biodiversity and by doing this also informing another layer which is more like uh, an urbanization la layer which is adapting itself to the, 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 to the, 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 the sustainable infrastructure. Um, we are also working with Peter Trammer which is a very interesting guy who's, uh, who's leading a master in associative design at the Slago Institute which is more related to um, other variables were uh, shaping uh, urban uh, fabrics according to social issues and building regulations. So we are really working on a very uh, differentiated um, uh, interdisciplinary approach. Uh, those are some of the um, ongoing uh, experiments we are doing on a sort of a uh, archipelagos uh, system that could eventually uh, avoid the risk of fluids and also take advantage of the, the proximity to the river to regenerate the vegetation and developing a sort of phytodeparation system that could be also used for housing projects. Um, I will, um, before, I'll, I'll, I'll switch to the other uh, part of my presentation. I will just uh, show some office uh, projects, just two of them. One is a very um, <laughs> uh, interesting project, uh, which uh, the very first phase was in 2007. Actually, it was, uh, uh, you know, in Paris, you have a very restricted uh, building regulation about the heights of the buildings. Um, and uh, the, the major of Paris was asking a team of architects to uh, provide some good ideas to convince, create a sort of consensus that could eventually uh, uh, allow politics to change the building regulations. So um, I start working on this project as a, more as an environmental uh, consultant and then I, I start to work on so on a, on a specific uh, site in uh, Porte de la Chapelle, uh, which is not that far away from uh, uh, the, the ring uh, infrastructure I was talking you, I was telling you before. And um, the project was a project where um, actually uh, the shape of the buildings were related to uh, uh, the idea of uh, channeling, um, as you can see in, in the top of this, uh, there was all this kind of a uh, design process where we we start to uh, um, define strategy or uh, of uh, distribution of tree towers and developing the shapes and the heights according to the idea of channeling. Uh, um, uh, the, 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 the main uh, um, winds, uh, because also the sound pressures was uh, um, uh, transported by the wind. So the idea was to break sound pressure uh, with this kind of channeling system. Uh, the channeling system was also related to the, the idea of uh, 
regenerating the air, which is very polluted, uh, by creating uh, high pressure and low pressure uh, uh, zones. Um, and there was also another um, <coughs> variable which was very interesting, uh, which is uh, how to create um, a sort of uh, balcony system, especially for housing, uh, for the housing tower, where the balcony was also providing a sort of winter garden uh, uh, in order to accumulate uh, solar radiation and create thermal comforts. This is another project of environmental rehabilitation for a private client in, in, uh, in, uh, in Milan. Uh, uh, but the idea was uh, the client was asking to uh, enhance the, 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 the performance uh, and have a sort of certificate certifying the, 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 the energy saving of the building by uh, just uh, adding a new skin on the building. Actually, what was interesting in this project that we try, we work really hard of this uh, uh, differentiated patterns according to daylight and solar radiations. And, so, and um, actually we had a sort of a volumetric price from the from the, um, the city of Milan because the, we proved actually with some simulation that we were, you know, uh, um, uh, respecting this kind of um, uh, parameters. And we had to, we, we, we actually we are working to add roof uh, restaurants and some other facilities on the top. So again, sometimes uh, working with environmental variables uh, even in the practice would um, could eventually create the opportunity to uh, um, um, some, some financial uh, interest. Yeah, and um, the second uh, part of my, uh, of my uh, presentation tonight, this evening, is, uh, is uh, let me close this one. Okay. It's related to another part of uh, my research agenda, which is uh, it's also belonging to my personal. <laughs> So yeah, I was, I, I'm originally Italian, but I grew up in Africa for some uh, personal reason. And I was always very much fascinated by some uh, very uh, interesting way of using a uh, simple material system in order to respond to very critical microclimatic conditions. And <coughs> Uh, of course, my uh, concern was uh, not just uh, um, speculating on this uh, subject uh, as a, uh, in a way in order to produce some naive experiments, but was really uh, to understand the, um, the, the functional aspects of this kind of uh, emergent system. And I tried to do some research on scientific and architectural literature about, uh, you know, this kind of architecture without architects' uh, uh, issues. Mm, and I was quite mm, critical at the beginning because all these kind of literature w were just catalogs of examples without uh, really looking at, at, at this uh, enormous uh, uh, pool of, of, of very interesting uh, uh, techniques and, tra and traditional uh, 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 way of producing dwellings without, without really going deep in how this could be some, uh, somehow re um, reinterpreted. And again, I think, as we were saying before with John, is, uh, what is interesting here is not just producing uh, a very formalistic way of working with uh, a low-tech uh, uh, design, but it's also uh, starting to integrate 
uh, an relationship between anthropologic aspects, uh, um, material uh, constraints, and microclimatic conditions. And I start to, uh, to really be uh, fascinated by the very um, complex and uh, an um, implicit way of uh, some of the Sahel region uh, uh, cultures to develop self, um, unplanned settlements and very uh, self-organized system um, where again, the, 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 the key word were always the same, um, you know, uh, self-adaptability, um, recursive geometry, uh, and I discovered some very amazing uh, um, aspects related to that, um, where the very first, uh, let's say, generative uh, uh, driver where more related to religion uh, issues or social issues or the way the community is organized, the family, hierarchies. And those systems are um, intelligent and very smart because they are responding to uh, uh, also uh, uh, very uh, specific climatic conditions where uh, most of them are um, uh, dealing with uh, deforestation dynamics. Uh, when, when you work in uh, such a place where you really cannot import wood and where it's very uh, expensive to import concrete uh, and other uh, structural system, uh, you start to work on very uh, interesting shapes. When the shapes is the final result of uh, uh, developing woodless construction. You're really obliged to um, um, work always with the same component and proliferate in a way that you can have a sort of dwelling out of that. And there's a sort of a very interesting uh, uh, way of producing a relationship between uh, the architect architectural scale and the more, uh, let's say, uh, large scale uh, uh, patterns. Um, <coughs> with, of course, a, a, a huge uh, a range of, um, of languages, uh, uh, techniques. Um, so I, s I start to ask to myself how I could eventually work on these issues in a more systematic way, and I start to, uh, let's say, pseudo-scientific way. I was quite interested to through the work of uh, uh, people which were not necessarily architects, but more like anthropologists or computer scientists. Ron English is one of, one, uh, of these um, person, a very interesting guy, who started to um, reproduce uh, mathe mathematical models out of uh, um, uh, this very uh, uh, implicit system. And uh, in parallel to that, I start to make some very interesting experience, experience with my uh, students, uh, changing materials and components. Uh, actually, this was uh, with some AA students from my former master and, uh, and Mark Hamill Unit 7 uh, in Ghana where actually we were working on a very uh, specific local wood, uh, developing a sort of um, wood pavilion, where the, the, the aim was uh, basically to develop a sort of uh, overshadowed playground for primary school children. Uh, um, um, but the idea was also to uh, just uh, not just stick to one material, but try to use uh, the same logic with other climatic conditions. And so we start to, I start to work with some uh, students also to other experiments in, uh, in uh, other countries, 
like Burkina Faso and Mali, where the climatic conditions really obliged you to work with um, uh, woodless construction. And it was very, very interesting at the beginning. Actually, we started to do some, some experiments, some analysis in, in Paris, and then uh, we moved to the, uh, a small village, like uh, 150 kilometers from Ouagadougou, which is the capital. And we started to work on a sort of a participative project with the people of the, of the, of the village, of this idea of uh, creating another pavilion for a sort of uh, overshadowing structure in, uh, in, uh, in uh, just beside the primary school. Uh, it was quite a challenge uh, <laughs> for all of us. Um, we actually tried to be very, uh, just use uh, the village material and the village stones and uh, earth to make uh, a sort of uh, uh, systems of arches that um, somehow generates the primary structure for um, another system of uh, women uh, uh, um, uh, um, woven uh, texture made by peop the people of, of the village. And those kind of experiments are uh, quite useful because you really uh, <laughs> somehow test how when you when you really go on site and uh, you have to manage a lot of <laughs> unexpected problems according to the, the behavior of the material and the climatic conditions, you have to be smart enough to actualize. Uh, um, um, your, your system, and at the end of the day, you really discover that it's very powerful to tr try to, to bridge, uh, um, try to bridge this this uh, information-based process and the more low-tech uh, aspects. And some of the, the things that and some of the person that really inspired me in this kind of approach were very unknown designers, architects, like this one. This is an 80 years old guy, originally Italian. Uh, it's called, it's an Aga kind of word architect, uh, very low profile. Uh, his, his name is uh, Fabrizio Carola. Um, he studied engineering in Brussels and it's almost 40 years was living in Mali and in Sahara region. <coughs> and a very interesting uh, built portfolio. Always with this idea of using a very simple component to explore different structural morphologies and adapt this to very contempor contemporary needs, uh, making hospitals and uh, schools. And it took me um, almost five years to contact this guy because actually he doesn't have any mobile number, any internet and <laughs> email address. So I was sending him just mails uh, in Bamako and he suddenly called me once on my French mobile and saying, Paolo, I received everything. I apologize for the delay. Uh, I think we got something uh, very interesting in common. Let's try to meet up. I mean, Russell. I was quite scared about that because uh, to, to show my, 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 my work and, and I, we were quite surprised, both of us, because we found a lot of things in common. Uh, even if it was another generation and with other tools, this guy is just throwing and drawing. Uh, uh, but he's a very parametric designer. So he's, he's the one who started to really speculate on how to uh, develop very differentiated material system um, without using any computer modeling. But he was, he was also very interested in do this in a more systematic way. So we find, um, this is a one of the <laughs> very interesting tools that is uh, analogic tool that is using in order to develop very 
complex shapes. It's a sort of analogic compass uh, that we are trying to evolve and push a little bit more forward. Uh, so we said to ourselves we had to do something together. And we start to work on a specific project in, uh, in, uh, in the Mali, in the Dogon region, which is, culturally speaking, I think is one of the most richest places uh, in Africa because of the Dogon uh, traditional techniques of uh, earth architecture. So we start to, actually we start to, you know, making some uh, environmental analysis, but also according with Fabrizio Carola experience, start to work on an, an initial prototype and eventually evolve in terms of uh, organizing the system uh, according to the, the, um, the relationship between uh, voids, cultures, and, and built uh, systems. And using his initial system as a as a driver, uh, we decided to uh, uh, you know always test how uh, this this system that are always related this to uh, be uh, developed um, on a, a central space, uh, which is belonging to the local culture. The central space is uh, is not just a courtyard; it's just, it's a, a community space which is very important to share, uh, do public activities, markets, things like that. So we, we start to work on this concept, uh, trying to develop very differentiated culture in order to uh, <coughs> have a sort of a, um, uh, gradient of uh, spaces in between indoor and outdoor, uh, providing domes in, in domes, uh, so second, second skin, and uh, also have a sort of network of cultures that could eventually uh, uh, be uh, um, useful for water collection. And one of the main problems here is that uh, there's a um, just one month per year where all the rain is concentrated. Uh, and um, so it's uh, in terms of quantity, it could be like uh, the same quantity of one year in Los Angeles or even more. But the problem is how to uh, stock, uh, store the water and purify. So the, the courtyards are made with these intentions of creating a network of uh, artificial uh, um, under, under underground uh, storage. And, and we start also to um, make some analysis of not just at, this, at, at the architectural scale uh, 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 with this idea of having this, you know, kind of uh, overshadowed culture that uh, could eventually work as a wind chimney, but also as an impluvium uh, system uh, collecting uh, rainwater. Uh, we're starting also to work on, a, on the idea of uh, producing some site-specific analysis on the, on the skin of the domes. Um, again, the dome is, there, is a result of, this, of, uh, the, of a designer decision of using the terracotta brick as a component. So it's a not a formalistic, uh, uh, it's a um, uh, de decision that was very mm, related to uh, local condition. <coughs> but what, I mean, my interest was also to understand how could eventually um, define a, a, a catalog of possible uh, uh, configuration where uh, uh, just mm, developing a sort of mutual rotation of some of the bricks could define a gradient of, of porosity and try to test also how this, uh, in terms of daylight distribution could, could, could work. And then <laughs> uh, I start to also uh, be interested in, uh, in you know, bridging 
uh, Fabrizio Carola uh, approach to uh, and you know Sahel uh, traditional techniques to eventually uh, more computer aid manufacturing techniques. So I was asking to some friends from the Smart Geometry Group to develop some some experiments and we uh, decide to uh, uh, take advantage of uh, the last smart geometry uh, workshop in Barcelona to uh, take the ATHZ robot uh, using that for uh, making a sort of a scale one-to-one -one prototype um, using a sort of a interlocking system where actually the robot was making out of an initial component a catalog of uh, uh, cutting and interlocking. Uh, and so by doing that, uh, uh, as I was saying before, the aim is also not just producing naive experiments in Africa or somewhere else, it's also uh, take a material system and reinterpret it and see what how could eventually could uh, 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 repurposed um, in uh, in uh, other conditions and with other um, material uh, constraints. Um, then we went back to uh, our project in Mali, which actually is under construction. Um, one of the purpose of this project is also to involve students like you in the building construction. Actually, we. We um, involve students from everywhere in the world, uh, collaborating uh, for a couple of weeks and uh, a small part of the project, and hands-on on a very interesting way of, uh, uh, because the idea of this, this, this cultural center that has to be also a training uh, center for traditional uh, low-tech, uh, uh, low technology system, and uh, not just for um, Americans or West or European students, but also for local people, because one of the problems also that young young um, people are losing uh, their tradition of working. They really don't identify this very rich and interesting uh, way of producing dwellings with the contemporary architecture. So one of the challenges uh, uh, invite them and, and uh, learn uh, uh, somehow uh, uh, learn something that is already belonging to their culture. Uh, this is <laughs> Fabrizio. Uh, so I think this is my last slide. Uh, I hope you you enjoyed, <laughs> and if you have any questions, uh, thank you. <laughs>